Greetings, and welcome to Spotlight on Chronic Myeloid Leukemia Telephone and Web Education Program. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. If you are participating by telephone and require assistance during the teleconference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. It is now my pleasure to introduce your moderator, Lizette Figaro Rivera. Thank you, Lizette. Please begin. Thank you. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, I'd like to welcome all of you. We have over 1,200 people participating from across the United States, as well as other countries, including Australia, Canada, India, Ireland, Israel, Kuwait, Mexico, Nepal, Nigeria, the Philippines, Romania, Trinidad, and the United Kingdom. Thank you all for joining us today, especially since part of the United States is experiencing hurricane conditions. I do want to let you know that Dr. Sweet is on the line with us. She is in the path of the hurricane. Um, so we wanted to thank you for being with us today and understand at any point if you do have to leave the program. Today, our admired CML experts, our key opinion leaders in the field have volunteered their time to discuss how far we've come with CML treatments and how they are working together to find a cure for CML. Dr. Atala from the Medical College of Wisconsin will speak about the history of CML treatment and frontline and advanced phase treatments for CML as well as introduce the CML Consortium, followed by Dr. Morrow from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, who will discuss clinical trials and treatment-free remission, followed by Dr. Sweet from Moffitt Cancer Center in Florida, who will finish the presentation with her insights on emerging therapies, as well as improving quality of life with CML. LLS helps you navigate cancer treatments and ensures that you or your loved ones have access to quality, affordable, and coordinated care. Research will help us achieve an end to cancer. In the meantime, patients and caregivers need help before, during, and after a cancer diagnosis. LLS is the leading nonprofit that does just that. Please continue to inform us of what you need during this time, and please continue to let us be here for you. Closed captioning is available for this program, and the closed captioning button can be found under the video box of the speaker. For this program, we would like to acknowledge and thank Bristol Myers Squibb, Novartis, and Takeda Oncology for their support. If you're participating today by a computer, the speaker slides will display as you see them via video and hear their audio through your computer. You can also print or view the slides from our website at lls.org forward slash programs, or you can download and print the slides from the materials tab on this program's web platform. You can listen to today's audio from this program at lls.org forward slash programs after the presentation. And following the, this presentation, we will take questions from the audience. I'm now pleased to introduce Dr. Atala, who will start the program. Dr. Atala? Hello, everyone, and thank you, uh, Lizette, for organizing this, uh, this program. Um, so uh, I'll jump into it right away because we have uh, limited time with lots of um, information. Um, these are our disclosures. Dr. Morrow will uh, list the disclosures when, his, when it's his time to, uh, to, uh, to give his presentation. <clears throat> so what, we'll, what I'll talk about is the history of CML, uh, and then I'll talk about the choice of first-line therapy, second-line uh, line therapy, and future directions and where we're going. Um, this was a nice T-shirt from one of my uh, uh, patients uh, showing the CML World Day 922. So for those of you who don't really know uh, the history of CML and how far we've uh, come, um, I thought just a, a little reminder of, of how much things have pay, uh, changed over the last uh, 20 years. Um, so I'll jump into right here, like it was first 
1973, when the, when the Philadelphia chromosome was first identified, which is here. Following that, from 1975 all the way to 2001, which is 25 years, if someone had CML, the only option for treatment, uh, or the only cure really was a stem cell transplant. Um, uh, obviously, stem cell transplant is still something that's done for patients with CML, but it also is associated with significant side effects and morbidity. Other than transplant, interferon was also there. Interferon did put a small percentage of patients into remission, um, but it was also associated with significant side effects. Starting in uh, 1998, clinical trials for imatinib started, and then 2001, imatinib was approved. From there on, then we have approvals for the second generation TTIs, which are the satinib, the lotinib, and bocitinib. And then 2012, 2013, we have approval for ponatinib, uh, which is uh, an, which is identified as a third line TKI, and most recently we have another approval, asimenib. So we went from a treatment of like the only choice for treatment is a stem cell transplant or uh, interferon to having six different drugs that we could use for this uh, disease and adjust according to response, side effects, um, and and tolerance overall. So pretty amazing progress over uh, maybe uh, 20 to 30 years. Um, so I'll start out with a with a presentation. Um, uh, patients present you all presented with a different uh, different symptom, different way. Uh, commonly, patients now could present with just an elevated white count without any symptoms, where they were going under when uh, if someone was going undergoing uh, labs for any other reason. Uh, some patients present with hip pain, bone pain, pain in the left side of the abdomen of the belly from of an enlarged spleen. And these are the different presentations for uh, patients with uh, CMF. And usually the questions that go through anyone's mind when, you, when anyone hears that they have an illness of any sort, I think, uh, uh, ro revolves around what causes this and how common, what's the treatment, how long, is, uh, how long will I live with this disease, what's the response, how will, I, how will I be monitored, and will I need to stay on treatment forever? I'll address some of those. Uh, but I'll leave the treatment forever uh, for Dr. Morrow with the next presentation. So you all know that uh, CML is really caused by the Philadelphia chromosome. And the Philadelphia chromosome uh, is a translocation between chromosome 9 and 22. Chromosomes are essentially the computer system of our cell. Uh, so under the computer system of the cell, you have two pieces or two little computers sitting next to each other that they're not supposed to be sitting next to each other. These two little computers send messed up signaling to the cell and they tell the cell, you need to divide, 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 don't stop without the regular control that we have. So that's what the Philadelphia uh, chromosome is. And CML is also characterized by three different phases, um, chronic phase, accelerated phase, and black phase. And before we had these treatments, before we had the TKIs, uh, Without any treatment, patients would progress through these three different phases, and just uh, and unfortunately, most patients would have died in about seven years. And that's again without treatment, emphasizing without treatment. And things are very different now, of course, with the treatments that we have. We currently have four drugs, NIBs, uh, that are FDA approved for frontline treatment of patients with CMS: um, imatinib, nilotinib, dasatinib and bucitinib, it's like a tongue twister. Um, and they're, they all have, um, they're very effective. And imatinib was the first one that was approved. Um, and uh, looking at the survival of patients on that study for imatinib, now we have 10 years of follow-up. And the, five, the 10 year survival is more than 80% of patients are alive and remain in remission with, uh, with imatinib. A pretty impressive result, again, compared to, to transplant. However, we know that only 60% of patients really stay on the drug that they start with. Um, and uh, there are patients who are resistant to the, uh, the, the, the disease is resistant to the treatment. So for that, the second generation TKIs were developed, which are, the, which are nilotinib, desatinib, and bocitinib. And they were compared head to head with imatinib in three different trials. And uh, 
they're not compared to each other. Each one was compared to imatinib separately. And they all have different uh, toxicities. Uh, so for example, uh, imatinib uh, mostly is known for causing GI, uh, GI upset, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, swelling in the legs, swelling under the eyes. It can affect the liver. Uh, uh, muscle cramps is, is sometimes quite significant and, and fatigue. The satinib, on the other hand, uh, in about 20% of patients can develop a pleural effusion, which is fluid buildup around the lung. This is not life-threatening. This is more annoying than life-threatening. And of course, very uh, inconvenient is probably like a very mild word because sometimes it requires a needle to drain out the fluid. It can also cause high blood pressure in the lung and can cause headaches. Nilotinib is given twice a day. It can affect the liver and also has a side effect which, ha which happens in about 10% of patients of affecting the blood vessels um, of the body. Um, so that's uh, been a concern with nilotinib, uh, especially uh, up front. Bucitinib was the last one that was FDA approved as first line and uh, common side effects for it include uh, uh, complications with the liver, which we can monitor for, a skin rash, and, um, and diarrhea. So we have these four drugs. How do we pick for uh, our patients, and how do you as a patient also pick which one is best for you? It, it really uh, 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 depends on, on several things. First, we know that the second-generation TKIs, which are the satinib, the lotinib, and bositinib, uh, lead to a deeper response. Um, those three drugs also compared to imatinib, there's a small difference in the progression to accelerated phase or blast crisis, about a three to 5%, depending on the study. Uh, but that progression to accelerated phase or blast crisis is, is, is pretty serious and significant, requiring a, a transplant. Uh, across all the trials, there was no difference in survival whether patients started on imatinib versus any of the second gen TKI. So we really choose based on a conversation with the patient. We choose based on side effects, other medical problems, and um, also a so-called score, which I didn't talk about earlier. A so-called score is a is a uh, a score for of the risk of the disease, and we make uh, patients who receive a second generation TKI who have a high risk so-called do better than if they uh, receive uh, imatinib. So many factors uh, go into choosing the uh, first line uh, TKI. There's really, really no wrong answer. Uh, it's just what's best for you, what's best for that specific patient. Once someone starts treatment, then we start looking at response. And the way uh, response is assessed in CML is by following that Philadelphia chromosome, mostly by PCR. And it depends on how long someone's been on the drug and how deep is the response. And these are the different levels of response and some of them are based on uh, doing a bone marrow biopsy, which we rarely do in following up patients. Um, and the two lower ones, which is major molecular response and undetected, but it's based on looking at the Philadelphia chromosome uh, by a sensitive test PCR in the blood. And these are the different levels of response. Uh, just uh, what, what they are, they're log reduction. It's a level, a log reduction compared to a standard value. What you really need to know, what I really need to know, um, is that the 0.1% uh, is a level called MMR, and then MR4 is 0.01%, MR4.5 is 0.0032%. So some patients come and ask me and say MR3, MR4. I really think it's so much easier to think of it in terms of just the numbers, the 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and just sort of don't get confused with the MR3, MR4, MR4.5. Just follow the numbers. And it's recommended that we follow the PCR every three to six months in general. And we also have, we have guidelines. Uh, one is NCCN guidelines and the other is ELN guidelines. These are the two big guidelines that uh, we have for CML. And based on how long has someone been on the treatment and how deep the response is, you could look at this chart and see, is this response adequate or not? So for example, if someone's PCR is more than 10% at 12 months, that's not, 
that, that's red. That's not good. But if someone is more than 1% at 12 months, that's yellow. That's, it's okay. We need to follow as long as the numbers continue to get better. We can follow and stay there. Um, so it's straightforward in terms, in terms of looking at this table, but also uh, we need to take into account, are the numbers going down? Is it a continuous downward trend? Um, how fast is the halving time? What's the dose that the patient is on? Uh, so some nuances, it's pretty straightforward with some, uh, some nuances that someone is not doing, uh, following the, the milestones exactly like you're seeing here in this table. So if someone's not following these milestones, one of the common causes for not uh, responding appropriately is not taking the drug um, because it's a, it's a drug that needs to be taken every day. And if I'm having side effects from the drug, I'm less likely, if I wake up every morning, I have to take the pill and I feel tired, I'll try to avoid taking the pill, uh, forget. Um, so uh, not taking the drug uh, is, is one of the main reasons we uh, see of why someone is not responding appropriately. Outside of that, um, resistance could happen because the way these drugs work is they bind to the protein that's made by this abnormal chromosome. Protein is the messaging system in the cell. So they bind to that protein and uh, some leukemias become smarter and modify that protein so the drugs can't bind, which is the bcr able mutation. Uh, perhaps the most famous is the T315i mutation. And that one, uh, only two drugs uh, are effective if someone has a T315i mutation. What's interesting about these mutations or the knowledge about these mutations is now with each drug, we know which mutations are more uh, sensitive to. So when we get a mutation analysis, uh, we can look at the type of mutation and say, okay, so pusitinib is better for you, nilotinib is better for you, or dasatinib is better for you. Um, and like I mentioned earlier for the T315i, only ponatinib and asiminib uh, work. So what about if someone is taking a math and is taking like they should, but is not achieving the milestones and not responding appropriately? On average, uh, if someone switches to one of the satinib, nilotinib, or bucitinib, about half the patients respond, and about three quarters of those patients continue to respond uh, two years out. This is pretty old data. We don't have uh, follow-up data for second line or for third line. Then we come to the, what's known as the third generation TKI, which is ponatinib. And um, in patients who are uh, resistant or intolerant to bisatinib or nilotinib, about half of those patients respond. And, if, and specifically in patients who have a T315i mutation, about 70% have a complete cytogenetic remission with uh, ponatinib. Ponatinib, however, does have a black box warning of also affecting the blood vessels of the, uh, of the body. Um, this is an important side effect. However, we have to balance that with how effective the drug is. And if someone needs to take it, uh, we know now that with some adjustments to the dose and uh, adjusting uh, the other cardiovascular risks or the other uh, uh, medical problems of the patient that could uh, really help in reducing that, that risk. And finally, most recently, uh, Asiminib was FDA approved for patients who have been on two prior TKIs uh, and not responding. And Asiminib is really a drug that just binds to a completely different spot than the other uh, uh, five drugs. Uh, so uh, works in patients who have been on a TKI and not responding. And in a study, the way we figure these things out, which I think you all know, is we have a, a large study, flip a coin, someone takes a simonib and someone takes another drug. In this case, in the study was bocitinib. And with 24 weeks of follow-up, and this data has held out to 96 weeks, the percentage of patients hitting uh, MMR, which is 0.1%, about a quarter of the patients hit that. And at 96%, that number even went up to more than 30%. Asiminib is overall well-tolerated, does have a side effect of some GI upset, headaches, uh, high blood pressure, does cause changes in, um, uh, cause inflammation in the pancreas, 
Um, so it does have its own uh, set of uh, side effects. So uh, in summary, there's been significant progress uh, over the last few years for CMS. Patients need to, uh, to, to take the drug, um, go into remission. However, uh, we don't think that that's enough. That's, um, we need to do more. We need to get people to an actual uh, cure where not taking a drug and not having any detectable disease. And with that, we, um, uh, we, we've, uh, we started a CML consortium, which is in, uh, in, the, in the United States, which includes 19 academic centers. Uh, it's named after um, our good friend, our late good friend, Dr. Jean Curie, who um, encouraged this and unfortunately uh, uh, died in 2017. Um, so we named that consortium after him. And our goal really is to uh, keep moving the field forward and keep working on trying to find a, a cure for a CML by collaborating all together, clinicians, basic scientists, and hopefully we can get to a point of not just um, take a pill every day. No, we actually get to a point where can, we can cure more patients. They don't need to take their pill and they can completely forget about um, CML. So I know I talked very fast and we'll have more time for questions at the end. Thank you all very much. Um, next, I'll introduce Dr. Morrow. Um, Dr. Morrow, of course, is part of the consortium. He's a professor of medicine at uh, Memorial Sloan. <coughs> so thank you very much, Dr. Morrow, uh, for being with us. So go ahead. Well, thanks, Dr. Atala. That was a great overview um, of CML and uh, the nuts and bolts about our, our, our tools and our treatments. Um, so I kind of get to talk about the icing on the cake now. Um, I'd also like to thank the LLS for organizing this and hosting us. And I uh, can't underestimate the, uh, the dedication of my colleagues and the, uh, the terrific um, consortium that we've been able to develop in, in the U.S., the Cori, uh, um, CML Consortium, really with a goal to, to cure CML. So in the next few minutes, I'll speak to you about CML clinical trials, talk to you about this new era we're in and, and this new term of treatment-free remission and functional cure for CML. My disclosures, by the way, just to, to verbally state them, would be that I, I do partner with the main uh, manufacturers of TKIs, that would be Novartis, Bristol Myers, Squibb, Takeda, Pfizer, and um, some other smaller companies such as Sun Pharma, where they give uh, research support to our institution, the Memorial Sloan Kennedy Cancer Center, to run clinical trials. And I have consulted with those companies as we develop clinical trials. So Amantinib is the first TKI we, we had approved, and this was back more than 20 years ago now really changed the way we treat CML. To be frank, I think it revolutionized the approach to cancer therapy and was the beginning of a new era. This figure on this slide shows you how the, unfortunately, the trajectory of CML used to look. And thank goodness this is not the case anymore. On the bottom were the way um, statistically things went with CML um, in the 80s um, when we really just had medical therapy. Um, then <clears throat> with the advent of interferon and more use of stem cell transplant, we were able to help more patients survive and beat CML. But um, you can see the stark difference with the introduction of imatinib, how um, when that was available and the drugs that came after it, now instead of most people, unfortunately, having difficulties in succumbing to CML over a few years, now the exact opposite was the case. And nearly all patients were surviving CML. And that is unprecedented. We really don't have that kind of change in any other disease. <clears throat> and targeted cancer therapy really you know, was in its infancy. In 1998, when imantinib was in clinical trials, uh, then known as STI-571, there were three, quote, targeted drugs. Avastin, which was a global sort of vascular um, a growth inhibitor drug, and the anti-estrogen drug tamoxifen, and Herceptin, which was an antibody, was the first really targeted drug approved. That was 1998. In, in 2021, I purposely put this figure small so you can't read it because it lists um, the targeted drugs, you know, um, and actually it's just a partial list in solid tumors. And on the right is a now outdated list from 2021 of targeted drugs just in blood cancers alone. So <clears throat> Gleevec really set the stage and, um, and this was not that long a history. So we've really come a long way in targeted cancer therapy. Um, 
what what we've seen change with CML is, um, you know, and this was so uh, aptly put on the cover of Time Magazine back in, in 2001 when when um, um, Amanda was uh, going through FDA approval. We um, what we saw was that we now had an increasingly um, survivable cancer. These figures on the right show the life expectancy of patients with CML in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And what happened was it used to be inferior to or, or lower than the general population. And in the era of targeted therapy, it is now not inferior. It matches. So people's lifespans are not affected um, with the diagnosis of CML any longer. <clears throat> Dr. Tala went through you know, the, the therapies in the United States, I think um, if we take a step back, we recognize that globally, there's actually nine TKIs now um, approved. And, uh, you know, to give a nod to our colleagues outside of the US and South Korea and China, there are second generation TKIs that are approved, one called flumantinib, another one rodontinib, and also in China, a third generation TKI, um, ovarimbantinib, which is um, uh, active against the TP15I mutation. This is really, as many people say, a spoil of riches. We have a, a, a palette of drugs we can now use. And if you look at other diseases, CLL and, and, and other diseases um, as well, the same paradigm is following where we have one very good medication and maybe another class of medication also may develop, but we build on that and we just essentially develop 2.0 and 3.0 and 4.0 versions of the drugs we had to make them even better. So I just want to move back one slide and just um, make a comment on the importance of clinical trials. <clears throat> All of this development of TKIs is on the shoulders and due to the generous and brave and heroic really a volunteerism of patients willing to, to enter clinical trials. You know, clinical trials are designed, of course, to serve patients, but they come in different phases. Phase one trials may be just exploring the dose and the side effects of a drug with the hope of benefit. Phase two studies are looking to see perhaps how strong a signal and how good a medication is. And a phase three study is, is, is proving, is this, should this be our new standard of treatment? In 1998 was when the imatinib started in clinical trials. The phase one study for that agent had 54 patients. Those are some pretty, pretty brave patients who um, at the time there was no such thing as targeted therapy were taking essentially a pill with a chemical in it that um, was believed to be a, a small molecule kind of smart drug to inhibit leukemia. And believe me, confidence was not necessarily high. I'll have to acknowledge that clinical, um, that the, the support for that clinical trial came from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. So without that type of support, without that type of volunteerism and, and willingness and trust of patients, that trial wouldn't have gone off the ground. The good news I can tell you is that 53 out of 54 patients went into, a, to went into remission in that trial. In 2007, the first studies began for treatment for remission, which I'm going to describe in a moment. That was only 15 patients. Now, that was an even braver group of patients who now, just nine years later, after Amanda really was first in development, these patients hadn't had that long on, on treatment. Their doctors had proposed, you're in a very good remission, and we believe it may be possible for you to interrupt your treatment or stop your treatment and be monitored. Will you be willing to do it? And these patients stepped up to try that. I'm glad to say that exactly 50% of those patients um, remained in remission off treatment and really pioneered what is now our goal and our CMO consortium and one of our main themes for today, which is treatment-free remission. It's a very good story <clears throat> and it's based in really what I would say is an unmet need. Um, we have the, the, an increasing number of people surviving CML, which means the prevalence of CML is increasing. Not that it's happening more often, just that more people around are living with CML. The number of people um, who have a safe and stable remission is very high. And there are now guidelines and essentially it's, it's um, um, approved and um, able to be the case where people can have deliberate and careful monitored treatment cessation as long as they meet certain criteria and are followed very carefully for something called a treatment-free remission or TFR. Some of, the, some of the wrinkles are is that we don't have the ability to get everyone to that finish line. We have about three quarters over long periods of time of patients who are able to get a deep remission. So there's already a fraction of people who aren't able to have that opportunity. That doesn't mean they can't do quite well, but they're, they're, they're not able to. From that, about half of patients are successful. So that's not what we'd like to say. We'd like to say that nearly all patients are able to achieve the, the remission and makes them um, possible to potentially stop treatment and that 
not just 50% or slightly less of patients are successful. So, <coughs> excuse me, we want to do more. The, um, the successes are, are sweet, I can tell you, um, but the, uh, sometimes the failures are bitter as well. Uh, on the top are just some of the figures on just how stable the population looks once they um, make it past the initial period when, when they may need to be retreated. And uh, in a word, that is not a turbulent time and people are able to regain remissions at extremely high or near perfect rates with very little um, change in side effects. Um, and, but again, this is not always successful. Um, on the bottom is a photo of one of my patients who I've followed for new, more than two decades. A very brave woman who actually went on some of the first amantinib trials, who went into a very deep remission, was doing very well, had stopped treatment, not once, not twice, but three times to have children and did so successfully, but wasn't able to successfully stop treatment as part of a, a cessation trial. Um, so it's very good and we're looking to do better. And you know, it, um, it, it, it can really, be summed up in, in one woman's story. This is um, uh, th this woman's name, just because she's quite public about her CML is Erin Zamet Ruddy, who's also a strong supporter of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and has raised a, a, a large uh, number of uh, dollars and awareness. And here's me as a young hematologist starting to care for her when we were both a bit younger. And here's her three children, her three beautiful children who are now growing older with her and, and she's doing quite well. Um, the, um, the reason why we're pursuing treatment for remission is that, uh, you know, it's a balancing act. The, as Dr. Atala nicely summarized, these side, the TKs we use, they don't have a lot of side effects, but they certainly aren't side effect free. And some of them are somewhat concerning. He touched on several of these uh, in describing each drug, where we have some specific um, side effects of special concern, vascular side effects or cardio or cardiopulmonary side effects, again, which can be identified and managed, but are somewhat more risky. <clears throat> not, a, not a bad reason to think about coming off treatment. Another good reason from a global perspective or maybe from a, from a more societal perspective is that there's a, there of course is financial toxicity. We love to say that patients have an easy time getting medications and having them covered. And that's definitely not the case. Global access, even and US access is variable. And sometimes there's hardship and, and um, uh, excessive costs. Um, Generic therapy isn't always as cheap as we'd like it. <clears throat> and you know, we'd love, love to see a paradigm shift where we don't have to think about lifelong therapy, but we can think about a defined duration of therapy, which would change the economic equation and allow us to minimize this financial toxicity. And CML is not the only disease in which this question has come up. So you know, it seems like it would be a no brainer. Um, if you're eligible and you, you could, you'd wanna stop treatment, but that's not always the case. Um, some nice work by uh, Catherine Flynn, uh, Dr. Tala's partners at Medical College of Wisconsin in preparation for our treatment free remission trial done through the consortium, you know, um, with uh, executed patient surveys. And it, treatment free remission really wasn't for everyone. There were some patients who were both on, on the positive side and some on the, on the hesitant side or the negative side. And, and that's quite uh, normal, expected and reasonable. It's not for everyone. Um, but it, it, uh, we'd like to be able to um, you know, avail pa as many patients as we can to it. <clears throat> as I mentioned, guidelines have been set and are now been adjusted through the years. So the National Comprehensive Cancer Network in the United States and the European Leukemia Net both have guidelines for us to uh, follow. And, and we encourage patients to look at these and, of course, providers to follow. Um, these are the ground rules. Who's eligible? How to do it? How to think about retreatment? Um, if if um, the, uh, the molecular response may be uh, lost or increases. So, so I think um, it, the, the devil's in the details, um, but the ground rules are there. So um, we just have to follow them. As I mentioned, there've been many different trials and our own consortium did what I would say is the only independent, um, uh, meaning non-pharma supported treatment free remission study in the United States called the LAST study, very aptly named meaning that was the last pill patients hopefully had to take. And what we were able to show is that our success rates were very similar and matched the global experience, that the response um, parameters, the data we had on patients helped us actually predict how they might do, which is really helpful to advise patients on, on their expectations and maybe need to retreat. The, the other important element we learned in, 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 in these trials was that side effects um, clearly reduce. And on the left, you can see some of the side effects before and after as, on, a, on a scale and, and the stark reduction yellow, you know, you're sort of dropping the minus level below the, below the, the norm uh, versus where the side effects were above the bar and positive uh, while, while patients were on. Of course, restarting treatment did 
maybe bring on um, some um, return of side effects. And, and then lastly, we, we'd like to get smarter about our PCR technology, which is the molecular testing for CML to potentially predict even better who, who's gonna do well and how well they're doing during this endeavor. Um, interestingly, it's not always about getting rid of all the side effects. Um, there is this phenomenon called withdrawal syndrome, where if, when people move, through, move into a treatment for remission, they may have temporarily in about a quarter of cases, increase in side effects, which come from the, the absence of the drug. And it's not because it's, it's the CML being active. It may be that there's another target or another uh, mechanism by which the drug was affecting a pathway in the body that is now missing. And there's maybe some overcompensation or some a reset that's happening. Thank goodness it's generally not um, a reason to have to go back on treatment, but it can be something to work through and something to know about. The um, The other interesting point to make about treatment for your mission is that um, I think in a simple world, we'd love to say that the CML is gone, we can't see it, we stop treatment, we never see it come back again, and people are cured. It's a little bit different than that. What we do with treatment is put people into stable, deep remissions where we can see very low levels of the BCRABL signal um, that don't change over time, and it needs to be stable for a certain period of time before we think about stopping. If you go back to the very first you know, 15 patients that stopped treatment back in 2007, go back in the freezer and dig out samples, um, you can actually, with more sensitive PCR testing, see that you can still see the signal on these patients who were repeatedly negative, stopped treatment, remain repeatedly negative, and never restarted the treatment. On the right is some interesting research that's probably telling us that there may be sort of a background signal that may be coming from cells that don't um, are not really part of the CML, might not cause the CML to come back, of course. Um, which would explain why the PCR may not always be negative. It may not be um, undetectable even after treatment are successful after stopping. And um, again, we just are getting smarter and smarter about how we use the technology. And um, uh, the, we shouldn't take this as a sign of failure or of, of inevitable relapse of the CML. If PCR signaling or visceral positivity remains in some patients at certain levels. <clears throat> Many people ask, um, because if you think about treatment for remission, many people know it's a uh, cold turkey stop, if you will. Um, maybe we should, <laughs> excuse me, maybe we should ramp down, maybe we should de-escalate treatment. And there's a nice study from England um, called the um, Destiny Study where that was done. And I think it's maybe leading the way to show us that that's another approach. Maybe we could essentially narrow the population into the folks most likely to be successful by having a dry run with a dose reduction prior to stopping. Not standard, but certainly something we'll, that's been worked at, being worked on. Lastly, um, for my part, if you try once, it may be possible to try again. And there is some experience with trying a second time. And this is some of the very preliminary data from a study from Europe called the RESTIM trial, where it's not um, always a failure. It's, a, it's more modest success. And clearly, I'm about to share with you some very exciting studies we're doing to potentially see if we can do better in this second attempt arena. Um, the um, that if you look at the details of these second attempts, um, what's also of interest is that the early trials, not all patients um, actually needed to be retreated. So um, we have to look at the data carefully and understand. Um, and you know, it's interesting that um, we can't sort of always push the panic button too fast. We have very clear parameters on what's the level of, of CML that needs retreatment and what's not. And we're becoming smarter about that too. And, and we may be able to open this opportunity up to more patients as we learn more and more about this. So <clears throat> I think this brings us to the end of my section. Um, and I, <clears throat> I, I just want to say that um, our colleague, uh, Kendra Sweet, Dr. Sweet, who I'm, doing, I'm going to introduce anyway, even though she's, um, I think she's unfortunately now um, uh, under more duress um, in Florida, um, is a brilliant physician, um, is a, um, a leader at the Moffitt Cancer Center, is a, uh, a leader um, and uh, officer in the um, CML Consortium, is leading clinical trials uh, with us in, in, the, in the CML Consortium. And um, I'm, a, a, I'm sorry that she can't actually present her slides herself. So I have the honor and the pleasure of, of just walking through her slides as well. Um, and what Dr. Sweet had wanted to talk to us about in the last section was our trials in the consortium um, that are related to curing CML. The, um, 
the last study, which I alluded to earlier, this is a, a, a recapitulation of that same figure where we, we, again, in the United States, outside of pharma, um, looked at uh, 172 patients from uh, broadly collected through the US, <clears throat> trying to understand the success rates of patients coming off treatment, irrespective of what medication they were on. It was a much more real world and practical experience. And the results were very good that um, more than half the patients remained in MMR, um, which is the um, threshold at which we would think about restarting treatment. And we were able again to, again to show that uh, we could do it just as well as, as others had in, in, in other earlier experiences and that it was could be done in a practical way in the United States in the CML consortium. The, um, the patient report outcomes I had also alluded to. So I think Dr. Tree wanted to under, uh, underscore the fact that um, Overall, we generally see improvements in adverse events as we are able to take patients off treatment. One of the strongest reasons why if we, of course we wanna try once, but we also may wanna try a, a second time. So if we think about it from a, the standpoint of, of numbers, um, how realistic is it and, and what, how do things look like? If you take a group of patients on treatment for CML and, and look at um, how many achieve a deep remission, uh, over time, we may be able to squeeze out a, a, a bit more, but you know, let's say roughly 50% of patients um, are able to easily achieve a deep molecular remission, the kind of remission from which a treatment cessation can be um, proposed. From those patients, unfortunately, maybe roughly half, sometimes a little bit more, need to restart. So our fraction of patients who are successful um, with uh, this endeavor of treatment for remission, if you look at some of these numbers, isn't what we want. It, again, to uh, state it uh, plainly, uh, still the majority of patients um, need longer term therapy and we'd really like to do better. So um, we, um, we continue to endeavor uh, in our research beyond the last study <clears throat> and have looked at what could be the mechanisms why, by which CML persists. What are the reasons why uh, perhaps stem cell cells that may be very um, somewhat dormant, somewhat um, specific in their function and activity, um, remain in the bone marrow? Um, are there contributing factors from the bone marrow, from the stroma, where the cells that support the blood in the bone marrow? Are there different signals we could interrupt? And we have a couple of good ideas. And <clears throat> this um, was the trial that was initiated by Dr. Sweet, um, the first of our second treatment-free remission trials in the Cori CML Consortium, which essentially used the drug ruxolitinib, which is a JAK-STAT pathway inhibitor, um, in combination with patients' ongoing CML therapy as a way to change the quality of remission to see if a second treatment-free remission would be successful. In essence, people who tried to stop, who were retreated, who were successfully back in remission, were then entered into a trial where they took a combination of their TKI, no matter what it was, which hopefully was going well and was at, a, at the previous um, tolerated dose, uh, in combination with ruxolitinib, which had already been tested by Dr. Sweet and others at, at Moffitt Cancer Center, and we knew the combination was safe and well tolerated. Um, they were followed for a year in a standard fashion, and then both drugs were discontinued to see if a deep remission could be sustained with a second attempt. A very smart trial design, which um, is an ongoing study in the, in the United States. Uh, we've enrolled um, uh, nearly half of the patients, maybe a little bit less, and we're looking of course, for patients um, interested, so please reach out to Dr. Sweet or the CML Consortium, Dr. Atala, myself. Um, this is how the uh, treatment-free remission phase looks. Um, this is exactly as it should be. Patients are monitored closely monthly for the first six months and then every two months and, and then closely even thereafter. And under strict rules, um, based on the PCR values, patients are able either to maintain off treatment, either have their monitoring picked up if there's a sense that things may be changing, or they are restarted if unfortunately the PCR is fairly, you know, clearly rising. <clears throat> the compound assimilative, which I, I've had the pleasure of being involved in the development in its phase one and its phase three trials, I think is a remarkably interesting drug, very safe and, and very active in resistant CML. So it's quickly being moved back into earlier lines of treatment and other settings. So since assimilative is different and it targets what's called the mere stoil pocket, which is not the same area where all the other medications we have available, all nine of, all eight of the other nine drugs are targeting the ATP binding pocket. So we essentially we have a drug you can use together with one of the available TKIs where they would both work. So I um, endeavored to um, 
extend the efforts in the CMO consortium. And uh, I had crafted the second of our second treatment-free remission trials, um, where we're gonna use a combination of a seminib with a manib. This is exactly the same idea, which was proposed and is ongoing in Dr. Sweet's trial, where patients who have started treatment, uh, sorry, who have stopped treatment, and then they had they were on a manib. Unfortunately, they needed to be retreated. They were then um, treated back into remission with a manib, and they're going to add a seminib to their manib and be followed for a year uh, under standard conditions, and then undergo a treatment-free remission, during which, again, they're followed um, per guidelines uh, in a meticulous fashion to either be able to maintain off-treatment, to be able to uh, be followed more closely if there's a sense for relapse, or if, if relapse is uh, if apparent, they'll be quickly retreated and, and brought back into remission. So we're very hopeful that these trials will yield better success for second treatment-free remission, we're, we're really um, encouraged to build this consortium and the uh, continue the endeavors, um, really inspired by, by Jean Curie and all of us now together in his spirit um, that we believe we, we can cure more CML. Um, and lastly, just one, one slide um, on a, 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 an additional trial in the consortium where um, uh, Jorge Cortez, another brilliant leader in, in our field, um, has written and we're going to pilot the use of Aseminib as first therapy for CML, which um, shows you our, our enthusiasm and uh, for, for this drug. Um, and, and one nuance to this trial is that if things don't go essentially ideally, patients will be able to take advantage of this combination strategy and, and can add Nalanib to Aseminib to try to recover any shortcomings um, with initial treatment uh, using this approach. So this trial is just opened as well. And we encourage people, if this is the setting they're looking for first treatment to reach out. <clears throat> so with that, I'll borrow Kendra's thank you slide. I don't think Tampa looks like this at the moment. And I hope our hearts go out and our thoughts go out to all those that may be affected. And um, thank goodness we know our, our colleague is safe, but I think uh, it was very difficult uh, for her to, to, to join. And we, uh, we're sorry for that, but um, I'll stop there and turn it back to our, our moderator and open things up for our Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Morrow. Yes, Dr. Sweet did have to move location due to the hurricane. So um, we do wish everybody, <clears throat> as you mentioned, um, safety <clears throat> during this time. Uh, thank you so much for such great information and for all that you're doing for our CML patients. It's great to see that experts in the field have really come together uh, for the greater cause of curing CML. And I know that with all of you working together, um, a cure is surely on the horizon. So it is now time for our question and answer portion of our program. For everyone's benefit, please keep your questions general in nature without many personal details so that the doctors can provide answers that are more general in nature. Operator, can you please give instructions to our telephone and web audiences? Thank you. To participate in the Q&A session by phone, please dial star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you are joining us by web, simply click on Ask a Question, type your question, and then hit Submit. We will take questions in the order that they are received. We can only take one question per person. Once the phone question has been voiced, the operator will transfer you back to the audience line. Again, to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad or click on Ask a Question, type your question, and then submit. Thank you. And we'll take the first question from our web audience. Michael is asking, if I have other health conditions such as high blood pressure and multiple spinal fusions, am I still a candidate for clinical trials as I'm not tolerating TKIs well? Dr. Morrow, do, do you wanna take that? Sure. <clears throat> you know, the, the average patient with CML has what we call comorbidities, other health problems, probably more than half. And those are common things, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart problems. Um, I know we emphasize that some of those side effects can come with treatment. Um, if we know about um, conditions beforehand and we manage them carefully, it, it, we can still avail patients to most therapy options. And some clinical trials do have restrictions and have some eligibility criteria, um, but they're not designed to exclude people who have common conditions who are being treated well. 
they're really geared potentially to maybe um, uh, offering more safety and, and protecting some patients who don't have clear um, uh, safety uh, known with a new drug, meaning we're, we're worried new side effects or new problems may occur or specific health conditions could be a major concern. So I would always encourage someone to, um, to look into clinical trials and um, we go through a screening, you know, where we, we look at someone's health carefully, make sure we re review through informed consent, all the risks and benefits. And I think um, I would encourage someone to expect that they should be able to get the best of everything, even if, even if they have health conditions that are common, such as those. Thank you. And we'll take the next question from our telephone audience, please. Certainly. Our next person on the phone is Thomas from Missouri. Go ahead. Uh, yes, doctor. I have a question about, I've been on Spricel for seven years for CML, and one of the gray areas we have is when is it safe for someone to go off this drug, to take a drug holiday and not to advance into the more serious phases? Can you shed any light on that if there's any new data on that? Dr. Atala, did you want to take this one? You're on mute, Dr. Tala. So, Thomas, yes, there are um, guidelines who who can be considered for what's called treatment free remission, which is stopping the drug. So, the 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 people who would be eligible for that are patients who have been on drug for at least three years, and they have the PCR level is less than 0.01 percent for at least two years. Uh, chronic phase CML. Um, and so those, those are the patients that would be eligible for stopping. Um, when, um, when patients, uh, if you do fit these criteria and you do consider stopping, when patients uh, uh, stop, you need to, your PCR needs to be checked monthly for the first six months, every two months for 12 to 18 months, and then every three months forever. Um, the side effects that can happen with stopping include nervousness about coming in to get your check, check your PCR, annoyance that you have to come in and get your PCR check, and also musculoskeletal pain, which is like a withdrawal uh, syndrome, uh, which usually patients mostly describe it as pain in the hand uh, joints, um, and that usually resolves, if it does occur, usually resolves by six months. Um, so that's one way of just stopping. The other way you could consider or someone who's thinking of stopping is to cut the dose in half um, if you do fit these criteria, which is the permission for two years on drug for at least three years, to cut the dose in half, stay on that half a dose for a year. If the PCR remains uh, good, undetectable, then you can stop after that. So these would be the two ways that you could go around doing that. Of course, after talking with your physician and making sure that your physician is on board and um, is going to check your PCRs, et cetera. Thank you. And um, this question could go to um, both doctors. Jerry is asking, have you determined if taking a TKI can help protect against COVID? That's a very interesting question. Um, <clears throat> without getting into to too far down in the rabbit hole, I'll tell you that um, there is a mechanism by which BCR ABLE inhibitors, by inhibiting ABLE, there are viral versions of ABLE that might um, be some of the tools that viruses use. And the list of viruses goes beyond COVID and actually extends to Ebola and SARS, um, which uh, SARS-CoV-2 COVID uh, SARS -CoV is, that's one of them. Um, and there was a research during the Ebola crisis um, for any agent with that capacity, and Amanda was a candidate. There was a lot of work, of course, during COVID. We wanted to use anything we possibly could we thought might be effective, and Amanda was part of clinical trials. Patients without CML were given Amanda potentially as a, as a means to limit um, COVID illness. The results, unfortunately, never um, were able to yield because, thank goodness, vaccines were developed, so many clinical trials and it uh, too, too quickly. So I wouldn't say that we know that amandib is protective or can help against COVID. 
On the other hand, the International CML Foundation, of which many of us are part of and have contributed, I know um, Dr. Tala for sure and Dr. Sweet um, have um, registries where we've looked at the outcomes of patients with CML during COVID before vaccines were available and after. And thank goodness, I think it's fairly neutral and that the risk of COVID has been mainly age-based. There is maybe some negative impact for someone who's really just in, getting into remission or still, or may have not, doesn't have stable CML, but for stable responsive CML, COVID illness has been fairly similar to what you'd expect to someone without CML, not on treatment. And that's what I generally tell my patients. Thank you. And we'll take the next question from our telephone audience, please. Certainly. Our next question comes from Susan from New Jersey. Go ahead, Susan. Uh, yes, um, I did the original clinical trial in New York at Cornell back in 2000. And um, I was, um, I've been undetected since 2001, but I didn't stop my Gleevec until um, February of 2018. I am now almost five years TFR. And I was curious if this could continue a lot longer. Dr. Morrow? Oh, gosh. I was clapping for you if you didn't see that. Um, you are <laughs> you know, definitely a pioneer, ma'am. You're, uh, um, you're just what this call is all about. You, you were a brave participant in clinical trials. You uh, navigated treatment for decades, um, or a decade and a half there, at least. And um, you sound like a successful treatment free remission. And um, you're almost on the leading edge, but there are patients from the, the original trials started in 2007. So it's now 2022. So there are patients more than 15 years in treatment free remission successfully, um, like yourself. Okay. So, so I think the future looks very bright. Um, we continue to ask okay. questions. So um, I encourage you just to stay in close touch. And another effort we'd like to you know, see someday would be what we call a survivorship approach to CML, where we both, you know, we follow your CML, um, hopefully, or the lack thereof, and any other health issues you might have to learn about your success. So congratulations, and I expect your future is very bright. Right. It's always great to hear about somebody doing so well, right? Our next question comes from um, Amanda. Amanda is asking about weight gain with many of the TKIs. Um, can you address that? Dr. Tala? <clears throat> yes, Amanda, weight gain has been reported with the TKIs. We, <clears throat> initially, we were not really sure uh, because patients with CML, before they had treatment, they were losing weight, uh, not feeling well. And once they started the TKI, they started feeling well and gained weight. Um, we know there's also with some of the drugs changes with cholesterol. Um, so that's uh, something reported. The second thing that can also cause weight gain is fluid retention. Um, so not real weight, just fluid buildup. And you would notice that by having swelling in the legs, swelling in the eyes. Um, so these are the two possible mechanisms for weight loss. <clears throat> Sorry, for weight gain. With the, if it is fluid, you would have symptoms of shortness of breath, swelling in the legs, and maybe consider, uh, your doctor could consider using um, a diuretic, which is a medication to make you lose water. Um, if that's not the case and it's actual uh, weight gain, um, <clears throat> there is no uh, spe uh, specific fix for that uh, outside the regular uh, exercise diet um, that's suggested. Thank you. And our next question, Dr. Morrow, um, Leah is asking if an autoimmune disease can trigger CML or affect CML treatment. That's a very good question, very interesting question. I think um, what causes CML is probably ironically still somewhat elusive. I think um, some of the interesting facts we know are that the Philadelphia chromosome event can be detected in certain studies that have been done far more often than, than you'd expect and doesn't always lead to CML. So it may be an error that happens because of uh, you know, the way our blood divides, where the chromosomes are in cells and because of unfortunately some susceptibilities. Um, the only clear instances where CML incidence has been seen higher than what we'd expected, fortunately, 
are some pretty obvious situations such as nuclear weapons during World War II, which is a tra tragedy, to be honest. Um, so now that we have such a high proportion of CML survivors, I think we're going to be able to ask those questions, but I don't know if we have any answers yet. I don't know if we have a risk factor or a disease state or another illness that we know leads to CML. So I wouldn't say it leads to it. The second part was, would it impact treatment? And I think it definitely could. Some of the TKIs have some inflammatory and immune complications. I would don't want to pick on it, but I would say to say it probably has more of that than any other. So I would definitely enter into treatment with for CML, you know, with a little bit more attention to detail and caution than someone with autoimmune disease, making sure that that was well looked after, treated, well described, because we may see we may see um, we may see greater. Sometimes we might see less symptoms. There have been um, reports, anecdotal reports, in both directions. I don't think it's an obvious concern or a major concern, but it's certainly a possibility. Thank you. And we'll take the next question from our telephone audience, please. <clears throat> Certainly. Our next question comes from Patty from Washington. Go ahead, Patty. Hi. Uh, thank you for taking my question. I had started with Dr. Morrow, I believe, in 2001, uh, diagnosed in 2000. And I've been in remission for years on Cigna. And I want to know if you relapse, do you get major symptoms right away or do they come on slow? I recently got a whole bunch of symptoms that, you know, when I first got leukemia, night sweats, fevers, uh, itchy throat, I mean, a lot of things. And thank God, you know, it's not my, I had a PCR done and it's not that, but how do you, how do you know? Did you, did you want me to take that one, Ian? Because I, I think I know the call. Yes, problem. please. Yes. <laughs> Patty, it's nice to hear from you. Um, <clears throat> I'm delighted to hear from you. Um, I think this is a pretty, you, you asked a great question, and there's a pretty strong message we'd like to, to put out there is that patients need to be monitored regularly and carefully. And if things are done right, no, CML relapse should be something, or change in CML response status should be something that is unlikely to be triggering symptoms. I wouldn't say it's impossible, um, but it shouldn't be likely because we should be managing small changes, um, missed milestones, you know, sort of uh, changes at, at a level where the leukemia may, be, may go from it's 10,000 times below the untreated level to now it's 1,000 times or 100 times below. We have to do something about it before it's back to square one where symptoms are usually present. So Sometimes we don't have that kind of control. Sometimes the leukemia um, decides to be more aggressive and it can present with symptoms, but it should be rare. And if we have, keep our eye on the ball, hopefully we can uh, not see CML relapse or CML changes um, manifesting as symptoms, but it's really that we have um, news of it before um, by, by careful testing and particularly molecular testing that should be done regularly. And, and I, I, I say that because uh, some studies we've done in, in the U.S. and actually overseas as well is that that's not always the case. So I always encourage people to uh, to uh, make sure you're being monitored properly. And if you're not, just keep pushing the button. And if you and if you're not getting an answer, ring up one of the other specialists in in your area or uh, through the through the country or otherwise to get the right answers. Thank you. And Dr. Tala Ronda is asking. Is there a list of subsequent medical issues after taking interferon um, and TKIs for many years, such as hypothyroidism, metabolic issues? Um, so Rhonda, I'm not the interferon. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with interferon long term, so I don't know how long you were on um, interferon. Um, the TKIs, they, there are some reported thyroid effects, but it's really a, a, a rare thing, but it is reported. And it becomes a little hard to know um, because, uh, thankfully, uh, patients live for a long time, so you can, you can develop other medical problems. So whether it's truly related to the TKI or not, uh, it's hard to tell. But there are definitely reports of uh, hypothyroidism happening uh, for patients with CML on a TKI. Um, will be looking into 
that we are uh, hopefully going to get funding for a large uh, registry for patients, uh, 700 to 900 patients, where we'll be able to follow patients for eight years and um, <clears throat> and then be able to to uh, tell some of these uh, some some of these things. Thank you. And just continuing, Dr. Atala, um, Marie is asking about the treatment uh, for fluid in the lungs and around the heart with TKIs. Is that something that is common? Uh, so, Maria, the fluid around the lungs and the heart is, uh, I don't know if you would call it common. It happens in about 20% of patients who are on the satinib. Um, it's also reported with bocitinib, uh, mainly in the second line as opposed, uh, as opposed to the first line. So both of those drugs have that association with fluid buildup. Um, it's usually treated by holding the drug uh, tapping out the fluid, and uh, sometimes considering starting at a lower dose if you are responding well. Um, if you're not responding well already at this dose, cutting down the dose is not the best idea. I would consider switching to a different drug. Um, uh, or, uh, <clears throat> sorry, um, lost like this. Uh, so, so that, that that's how I would make a decision of whether to uh, switch or reduce the dose depending on how well you're responding. Or yes, and or the other thing, if it keeps happening, keeps repeating. Um, so you drain the fluid out, you go back on the drug at a lower dose, and then you get the fluid built up again. Then I would consider switching. So again, it happens at about 20% of patients on uh, the satinib, and a little less than 10% for patients on both satinib. Um, Thank you. Imatinib. Sorry, one more thing. Imatinib <clears throat> is more likely to cause fluid buildup um, in the lung, not outside the lung. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. And we, our next um, question uh, is interesting. It's from Jeff. Jeff is saying, "Is it true that 10 to 28 percent of health of the healthy population is uh, pH positive?" So Philadelphia chromosome positive. Uh, why do only very few of these contract CML? And this could be for either Dr. Atala or Dr. Morrow. I think I might have opened up that can of worms, so I think I'll try to close it up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so what's been done is studies using very sensitive molecular techniques has looked at people who don't have CML, just you know, sort of healthy, normal people, and said, can you detect a Philadelphia chromosome event? And it's not just one study, but there are a few studies where, yes, it's been shown. That doesn't mean that someone's walking around with the Philadelphia chromosome. It means that at that moment, using very sensitive techniques, you might catch a, a genetic error that's happened in a blood cell or evidence of a genetic error. To be honest with you, genetic errors are happening all the time. When you go out in the sun, you're not just worried about getting a sunburn or a skin cancer. Your, son's, your skin's getting damaged by the sun and it's undergoing DNA damage from the sun in real time. So please wear sunscreen. But, um, and the body repairs DNA damage when it, or it deletes things that are abnormal. So that's what's happening. So it's not that people are walking around with a Philadelphia chromosome and they don't have CML and some unlucky people are also walking around with the Philadelphia chromosome and they get CML. It's, it's that genetic errors happen. This genetic error is a strong one. And in certain individuals, probably for reasons that we'd love to know more about, it actually manifests and takes hold and grows and causes a disease, where in other patients it's deleted or it's corrected, or it just doesn't have the, the wherewithal to create a disease. I hope that explains that phenomenon. And I don't want people to worry that it's <clears throat> contagious, it's in the family, it's in the water, it's in the bloodline. It, it, it's, um, it's, there, are, there may be other instances where there are common genetic errors that we see. And there are, you know, the more we dig deeper into the genetic landscape, in the molecular landscape, the more we learn. And there are a lot of conditions people have where they may develop a blood disease or blood cancer because of a finding we see or a potential error that um, you know, may, may be manifest in the blood. Our blood just ages, if, to, be, to be honest with you. And that's a, a, a new field of clonal damage or clonal hematopoiesis in the blood, just for the record. Thank you so much for that explanation. Well, is that, sure, Dr. Is that, can I follow up just sure. one thing, Mike? So, um, the, that's a, uh, also a really good question for patients who go off drug uh, for the treatment for your remission because some of those 
patients, some patients can have a detectable BCR able. <clears throat> and despite that, just stay in remission without clinical disease for a really long time. Um, and we don't have an explanation for that. Like, why would someone have CML, go off drug, stay with a detectable Philadelphia chromosome, but never actually develop disease? Um, Mike, do you want to add anything to that? I um yeah I I was trying to explain that in, in in my slides I was showing you know some of the investigations have maybe postulated it it may be that CML causes a disease in in what's called the myeloid cells and then some cells in the lymphoid compartment or other cells in the blood also carry the mark of the CML but they can't cause the CML to come back and they're not cells that divide anymore they're kind of they're done but then they may not they may not be extinguished. So they may be, lead to that background noise or that background signal. But Dr. Atala's point is really worth emphasizing because it it's confusing and it's it's sometimes frightening to people who think about treatment cessation or how good their remission is when they say, How come it's not gone? How come it's not zero? How come it doesn't stay zero? Um, how can it be okay for me to be off treatment if it's not zero? It is. Um, and it's a little bit of trust there um, and a lot of explanation that's needed to, to work through that. But um, that's why we use the terms functional cure and treatment-free remission, um, because we're, we're, we're learning as we go. And we've learned a whole lot over, you know, almost two decades now um, in, in this area. Thank you both. <laughs> we'll take the next question from our telephone audience, please. Thank you. The next question is from Roz from Georgia. Georgia, go ahead. Yes, I've um, I had leukemia starting in two thousand three, and I've been on Gleevec and Flysil. Now I'm on Tosigna. Um, did those other two stop working? Is that why I'm I'm on Tosigna? And what is it doing that's different? Dr. Atala, Dr. Morrow, Dr. Atala, so, do you want to start? I can. Yeah, I'll, so um, you've been on, uh, for patients who switch in general, switching from one drug to <laughs> another uh, happens because one of two main reasons, really, either it's not working or um, that the patient is not handling it well, which is intolerance. Like th these are the, really the two main um, reasons for someone to switch from one drug to another. Uh, so without uh, seeing your records or knowing, it's hard to tell of which one it, which one it was. Um, but that, I think that's something you definitely should be discussing with your physician, and like Dr. Morrow mentioned earlier, if you're not getting answers, uh, then you um, should have a goal to go uh, get an opinion from a CML specialist. The other question of what, what difference is the Cigna doing? So um, all these drugs have different, uh, slightly different, they're the same mode of action, but they bind in slightly different spots. I, so remember we talked earlier uh, I don't know if you were uh, there earlier when we talked that these drugs bind to a, a certain part of the protein, the abnormal protein, which is telling the cell to divide. And that protein is the messenger. It's the, the messed up messenger. So these drugs bind to that protein. Um, and each drug binds in a slightly different way to that protein. So that's why for one patient, one drug may work and the other one uh, might not because of the way it binds. I don't know how much to add to that. I think those are great, great answers. And I always encourage people to get more specific questions answered by their, by their physician. Um, it's, uh, keep asking. Yes, definitely, Roz. And we are wishing you well as the storm um, passes <clears throat> through your area also. Um, our next question is from Stephanie. Um, she's asking about allowing patients the choice to pursue different fertility options. Um, she's saying that NCCN has tight parameters on discontinuing a TKI, but there should be some wiggle room for those of reproductive age. Um, I know, Dr. Morrow, that you have had uh, patients that have had successful 
um, births and successful pregnancies. Would you like to speak to that? Sure. I think we're all interested in this area. Um, anyone who's thinking about treatment-free remission in the back of their minds has people of childbearing age, particularly women, of course, childbearing age in mind, because um, that goes hand in hand. So it's true that formal guidelines and formal um, <clears throat> expansion of what to do to allow for um, women to uh, have safe pregnancies and to conceive around a CMOL diagnosis are, aren't available yet. There's a lot of guidance out there, a lot of knowledge. And I would say simply that if we can just marry the two agendas and if someone is eligible and and or potentially um, in the mode of a treatment cessation, um, pregnancy certainly should be a, a, something that can be discussed. Um, a little bit more on the other side of the fence would be that um, taking TKI therapy during pregnancy really is not something that's can, that, that we, we would um, say is acceptable. I, uh, th there are some instances where it, it has been uh, accomplished without, um, uh, without bad outcomes, but it's, there's a lot of uncertainty there and there, it varies by the medication. And honestly, the FDA puts labels on medications for reasons because it's, it may not be that it's, it's terrible. It's just that we don't understand. And we always want a, a healthy patient um, first, and then of course, healthy children, if they can uh, successfully uh, achieve pregnancy and, uh, and deliver. Um, but it, so it can be done. And I would encourage women to also, much like all anyone on the call, of course, this type of question really requires a lot of push because you may have to find specific people who have handled this question, uh, collaboration between a higher risk obstetrician and a CML expert um, is probably necessary. And um, I'd like to keep building a wall of fame of photos I have of, of children that have come from moms who had CML um, in whom both mom and baby are happy and healthy. Definitely, we would definitely continue to, to want to see um, healthy pregnancies and all of our families growing. Um, we'll take the next question from our telephone audience, please. Uh, next question comes from Stephen from California. Go ahead, Stephen. Is there a variability in terms of what lab measures the level, or is it, you know, and that therefore you should have, always have a draw in the same place, or are they all fairly comparable? And if you get a draw somewhere else, one time it's not a big deal. Sure. Dr. Atala, Dr. Morrow? Dr. Atala, did you want to start? Sure. Um, so, the, yes, there is variability from um, from lab to lab for sure, Stephen. Um, however, the international the IS ratio is supposed to equalize um, all <coughs> these uh, all the measurements across different labs, so we can all speak the same language. Having said that. What the IS ratio really is, it normalizes, um, if your lab measures 10, my lab measures one, then we take your value and divide it by 10, and that's the standardized ratio. However, if your lab is measuring 10 that's wrong or different, then there's no really enough correction to fix that, if that makes sense. Um, so yes, there is variability from lab to lab. Um, most large labs uh, do okay when you compare them to each each other. Uh, I always prefer to stick to the same lab. Getting an occasional lab checked outside to see how you're doing, for example, if you're traveling or something like that, is perfectly fine as long as you uh, overall the numbers remain okay. You always need to look at the lab and say, okay, this one is a little different than my home lab. Acknowledge that, but as long as you stay in the good, uh, like in the good response, the criteria that I showed, it's it's okay. Yeah, I I would second that. I think um, ideally PCR, especially when you get down to low levels, is probably best checked in in a, in the same lab. But the international scale or international standard has helps us to you know make sure the values are close, and as and, uh, and a big jump or a big change. Obviously, is a flag, um, but um, 
uh, otherwise it may be reasonable to, to compare values between the labs. Thank you so much. And our next question, Dr. Morrow, Sandy is asking, after a stem cell transplant, I tested negative for 14 years, and then the BCR ABLE came back positive. What might, what might this have happened? Um, is this common? It's, is it unusual? And I just did want to note for our participants that some patients with CML have gotten transplants um, as a treatment. Uh, absolutely. Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, <clears throat> there's always details and context, so I don't want to, uh, probably can't comment specifically on on this um, scenario, but what I would say is that there are different patterns of PCR results after someone's had a bone marrow transplant. It doesn't always disappear immediately. It sometimes can fade with time. Um, there are some different risks associated with people who have PCR that is detectable after transplant after a few years. We expect people to be cured with transplant. That's the ideal. We've, Dr. Tal and I both have been speaking about this phenomenon where PCR can be seen, but it doesn't always mean that CML is back. I think that's probably a very, uh, you don't want to make that assumption. Um, and in a transplant setting, of course, you know, much attention should be paid to a change in status. And then lastly, I think it has been reported where sometimes CML can occur again, or CML might actually be present in the donor bone marrow, um, which sounds very unfortunate, but hopefully would be very treatable. I think there's a couple of different um, situations to consider there, and I would definitely encourage someone to make sure they're getting a close follow-up and get those questions answered on the ground. Um, but the good news is hopefully that it may not always mean that the transplant um, is no longer effective or, or that um, all is lost. There may be a number of different options to consider. Sure. And doctor, are transplants um, being utilized still for CML with the availability of TKIs? They, they certainly are. The, the number of transplants is obviously, well, it is much lower um, just because the number of patients who need allogeneic stem cell transplant <clears throat> is much lower, but it's definitely still a consideration. Before we had TKIs, CML was one of the most treatable and curable blood cancers by means of an allogeneic transplant, um, which was a, that's a sort of a great problem, you know, that, and then we came up with TKI um, treatment approaches, and now we don't necessarily need to use it very often. So um, the most important uh, nuance there would be not to wait until it's too late, or not to think about or pursue it, um, when now transplant success isn't what I just mentioned. Um, so it should be always on the table, particularly for when things are not going well with TKI treatment and particularly before the CML moves out of a chronic phase. Sure. And Dr. Tala, Walter's asking, what is the history or prognosis of those young patients? So those patients under 25 um, with reducing their medication by half or more? So uh, Walter, overall, um, the prognosis for those uh, patients uh, remains uh, good, uh, understanding that we don't have 50 years of follow-up, right? I mean, um, but as of right now, um, we the prognosis overall remains uh, remains good for those those patients. Reducing the dose is definitely an option if someone is responding well, and that's something that really. Um, need a discussion with the physician for monitoring and looking at the response, what the patient is at right now, how things have changed. Um, so um, uh, reducing the dose really takes some expertise and discussion of risks and benefits and close, uh, close monitoring. Um, the biggest challenge I have seen in my clinic really for younger patients is uh, staying on the drug. Um, Younger patients have a very difficult time of staying on the drug. They're very busy, go to school, go to work, don't want to feel bad. Um, and that's really been a, a, a big challenge for me is to um, convince my younger patients, you really, really need to stay on drug. You really, really need to stay um, adherent to the regimen, hoping that one day you would get to a, a, a deeper remission that you would actually be able to, to stop. So that's really been the, the challenge, the biggest challenge is adherence. Thank you. 
And um, this question, uh, our final question is uh, from Elizabeth. She's curious for both doctors. What is the longest period of time one of your patients has been able to remain off of a TKI uh, once achieving uh, treatment-free uh -huh. remission? Well, since that, since uh, so go ahead. Eve. No, no, go ahead, Mike. You're older. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> thank you. I, uh, I was going to say since neither of us are French, um, although some of us may speak French, but um, the um, the original studies originated in Europe, um, and then they came over over across the Atlantic. So, um, but I have some patients who have been off treatment for roughly ten years um, that I'm able to follow. Also depends on where you're practicing. I'm, I used to practice in Portland, Oregon, in Oregon Health Sciences University, and I, I've some of the patients actually were on the call today, which was great. But I, 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 I had to um, pass those patients over to someone else. So I think I have some patients that maybe now successful after even longer that I, I took care of once. Dr. Tala, my longest is between seven and eight years. Yeah. Wow, that's great to hear. And one of, um, I, I just wanted to ask you, uh, since it's the end of this call, um, we typically didn't utilize the term cure for CML being more of a chronic disease. Um, so I just wanted to ask both of you and Dr. Atala, you can go first, um, why the consortium and why physicians are now um, striving to utilize the word cure for CML? Um, so why are we striving? I think um, if you look at the history of CML, we started with you need a transplant, um, which is we had nothing. And then you need a transplant. You could be cured with a transplant. That's great. Um, and then we switched to taking a pill, and then we're like, wow, this is great, take a pill every day. Um, but then we, as CML specialists, we're seeing uh, patients like yourselves every day, and we just know that that's not <clears throat> just good enough. There are symptoms, there are things that linger, a uh, question of like 50 years of, on this drug, what's going to happen to me? Um, so sort of our mindset just changed uh, gradually um, with a goal that we really need to get people, more people off drug, more people cured, uh, do more research uh, for uh, CML just because patients take a pill every day and, and they're doing okay uh, doesn't mean that that's, uh, that, that's, that's good enough. The goal of the consortium is, um, you know, C CML is, a, is a, by definition a rare disease. Uh, however, the number of patients is it's high because patients live for a long time, but, CNS, but CML is a rare disease. And that's why we have this collaboration. Um, we each bring uh, something different to the table from experience, whether clinical experience, lab experience, um, uh, population science experience. Um, and that's the goal of the consortium to put all our experiences together uh, to move the field forward. Um, <clears throat> I don't, have a lot to add, I don't have a lot to add to that, except to say that, um, you know, our perspective kept changing in CML. We didn't think targeted therapy was going to be as, as successful as it would be, and it was. And we didn't understand how deep remissions could be, and we dug deeper. And we created a new paradigm where people were on therapy indefinitely. And that wasn't typical in cancer. People historically with conventional chemotherapy took it for cycles, a few cycles, three cycles, six cycles until the disease was gone. And then we watched and we waited and we hoped the cancer didn't come back. Targeted therapy opened up an era where now people were on therapy for <clears throat> infinity, you know, sort of open-ended. So naturally when things got better, things got deeper, as Dr. Tala mentioned, you know, we clearly wanted to t take it all into perspective. We don't want side effects. We don't want to have any collateral damage. Look at how successful um, these treatments have been we immediately endeavored to think about how could we cure this. Our definition is a little bit unique and the approach is obviously very specific, but I think it's coming, it, it's time has come and we're all enthusiastic and we're here to serve you better in, in the U, in North America. And, uh, and we're glad to partner with LLS and, and everyone else to, uh, to make that a reality. Well, thank you so much, doctors, for being on this call today. 
um, all of you, Dr. Atala, Dr. Morrow, Dr. Sweet. We did have Dr. Sweet on again. Um, the hurricane asked, uh, was not able to uh, have Dr. Sweet stay on the line, but thank you all for volunteering your time with us today. We are excited about seeing the new advancements um, with CML treatment. Now, if you weren't able to get your question answered today and want more information, you may speak to an LLS information specialist at 1-800-955-4572 from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern time, or you may reach us by email at lls.org forward slash contact us. Webcast participants, please complete the program evaluation now as it pops up on your screen. And phone participants can complete the evaluation um, also at lls.org forward slash eval. So that's lls.org forward slash eval, or complete the form included in your mailed packet. For the professionals on this call, please note that there are no continuing education credits offered for this program. We'd like to acknowledge and thank Bristol Myers Squibb, Novartis, and Takeda Oncology again for their support of this program. And as a reminder, you can download and print the slides as well as listen um, and view the audio and video for today's program at lls.org forward slash programs. Again, doctors, thank you for volunteering your time um, and thank you so much for really getting together and collaborating um, and, and making it a reality that the research for CML um, is really uh, following through and providing patients, not just with new treatments, um, but with hope for a cure, as well as um, a better quality of life. Thank you so much. This concludes today's telephone and web education program. You may now disconnect your lines. Thank you for your participation. Have a great day.